Hey there, rockers, it's Ari Kamin, Steven Adler's lead singer, and you are watching Max 101 Rock and Roll. Man, it's been a while. You guys ready to do this? Hey, man, what's up? Let's do it. How are you doing, brother? Tora, tora, hey. Man, thank you so much for having me on today, man. I know. I'm so happy. I'm, I'm, so... happy to talk to you. I'm coming to you live from Nashville, man. Like Nashville, are you walking around your neighborhood? I see you're walking, exercising something. Yeah, I'm just cruising around. I wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk to you, man. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no, thank you. And, uh, you know, I want to to congratulate you for the latest album you know and I want to talk about it I have everything ready uh, you know in the next few seconds we're gonna start talking about it tell me a little bit of, about what you guys are doing lately I see that you guys are non-stop touring around the country uh, Colorado uh, La Lafayette right so so I yeah. So, yeah tell me tell me about Man, it. we're so excited we uh, we owe a really big debt of gratitude to Frontiers Records for just giving us an opportunity a platform and a voice to talk to the audience man it's been a really long time it was a big break between records and um we were just so excited about bastards of bill we uh we all were kind of nervous man i mean we were thinking about it. it's been a second we were like you guys we were wondering what it was going to sound like what it was going to feel like and uh man when we got in the rehearsal room to just go through our stuff we went old school. We went to our drummer's house. He's got a, like a soundproof room out of that he rehearses in. Okay. And as soon as they cranked up, I mean, I closed my eyes and I smelled stale beer and cigarettes. I thought I was 18. I was oh like, my yeah. god! Oh my god! That that you know it I think so good. it was so fun, man. We've we've been friends for 30 years, man. We we went to high school together. Keith wow. and Patrick each other since they were eight years old. Wow. And so, you know, a couple of years back, um, our bass player, Patrick Francis, kind of had a health scare. Um, he got a clean bill of health. He's in tip top condition. Uh, the doctor gave him a clean bill of health to get out on the road. And uh, all he wanted to do was go play, man. He kind of had a new perspective on life. We had a new perspective on life. We wanted to spend time together. Okay. Uh, that was probably the end of 2016 and uh 2017 the beginning of that we jumped on the monsters of rock cruise yeah amazing oh my god it was so cool man if, if anybody out there listening or watching has never been on it it's it's an awesome trip it's so great it was just stacked full of bands that we were all fans of we wanted to go and and watch the bands we were fans of them and uh that just kind of launched us back in we started touring Frontiers reached out to us in the middle of the So we were just wondering what the record was going to sound like, what it was going to be like, and um, it was just a great experience, man. We were so excited about the music and the ideas that we had for the new material, and uh, so we just uh, started thinking about a schedule. You know, when we when could we do it? We're all, uh, you know, rock and roll dads. We have mm -hmm. families and, yeah. and outside things, outside of music we're working on, so we... Uh, we had a friend of ours that had been an assistant engineer on Wild America, which was the, the last record that was out on A&M back in like the early 90s. Uh, his name is Jeff Powell, and he works at a studio in Memphis, Sam Phillips Recording. Um, 
and he was down there cutting straight to vinyl. He got a lay machine, and he had contacted me and said, hey, do you want to come down and do two singles with me? And he didn't know we were talking to Frontiers, and we said, man, you're never going to believe it. We want to come cut ten songs. We don't want to cut two. So we just scheduled it for last summer. It was right about this time, man. I mean, this this week, we were in the studio last year cutting the record. And uh, it was just a great experience. He was kind of uh, an extended you know, family member to us. He'd known us for 20 years. Oh, wow. And, uh, he knew the band. He knew how we sounded. And we, he knew we were nervous, you know, about going in. And he said, man, look, I'll make it really, really comfortable and really easy on you guys. And, uh, man, we just, we had a blast, man. It was so fun. It was amazing. It was awesome. So Bastards of Beale, right? That's, uh, that's the name of the new record. Yeah, Bastards of Beale. We actually had been going through some, some ideas for the name of the record. And <laughs> back in the early 90s, there was a, a lady named Sherry Sloan that had done an interview on us. She came to Memphis, did some interviews, and the name of her article was The Bastards of Bill Street. Oh. If you know anything about Memphis, Bill Street is kind of a, the, a tourist area, but it's the home of the blues. It's where W.C. Handy started playing his trumpet. Uh, it's where all the famous blues players came to, to uh, that ended up influencing the world. I mean, we feel like the... Bill Street means something kind of different to everybody. You know, for, from our standpoint, we were a little garage band that went down there and started playing rock and roll, and we were kind of just unaware of all the historical aspects of it until we kind of got ingrained in the music industry. And we started backtracking, and we realized what a huge impact it had. <clears throat> and Memphis itself means something to everybody around the world. Everything yes. from the blues to Elvis Presley to Stax, soul music, to the yeah. rock of the it's, it's that, so rich uh, in any kind of music you know like uh it's like a yeah. cradle of a lot of uh huge artists you know that it came yeah. out later you know everybody yeah. man from otis redding to al green yes. to willie mitchell that music is i mean it transcends time a lot of that music we still love it you know i mean yes. we're by we i grew up i'm from mississippi down in the delta we were around it our whole life but it means something to, to other people and so We're ambassadors of Memphis. Uh, we're of the of the city. We want to go out and represent. So, we just felt like this was a good opportunity to go in, cut a really raw record, good rock and roll record, and uh, it was just amazing. We just we loved it. But um, you know, there's a hat tip in there to that Sherry Sloan um, rock interview lady. She she was the one that kind of tagged that line on us. Okay. And so we went back and kind of grabbed that and just called it Bastards of Bill. Okay. So, uh, you know, right now we are, we are looking at the cover, you know, it's a blue cover, you know, with you guys like in a comic, right? It's like a drawing, yeah. like a comic. That's so cool. Who, who Man, wrote that? You, do you know the name of the guy? We had a guy, a friend of mine named Dean Tomasek. He lives here in Nashville. He's a great artist, like a, a artist that does all kind of artwork and graphic design and stuff. But he's also, he's a bass player. He's a great musician. Mm. He actually played in a band called Valentine's Saloon that was out in the 80s and stuff and I we figured it out after we had been talking for a while we actually played a show together a long time ago <laughs> and, uh, I met him through um, I was working with another artist and I was looking for somebody to help us with some artwork and some logos and I actually bumped into Dean I got referred to him I'd seen some of his work and I loved it and I kind of reconnected with him that way and so when we started talking to him about the the Bastards of Bill cover he sent us some mock-ups of what he was thinking and the first one was hilarious it was like pencil and we were like little stick people and it was raining and we were standing you know on the street and then he started sending us some uh some images that we could kind of compare it to and we just got so excited we said man we've never done anything like this before let's do something like that so it's so amazing i love that cover man like that that's such a great great cover that you know uh It's very difficult to put a good cover, you know, in an album. It takes a lot of thinking, a lot of time to, to make a decision, you know. Yeah, and hey, I'll tell you this too. Uh, the CD and the, and the vinyl, they have different backs. So uh -huh. if you get the CD, there's a picture of the band. We're on the back. But if you get the vinyl, there's actually a picture of Bill Street that he drew by hand. It's, oh, got, nice. all, it's got all the clubs on it. When I look at it, I look at those images on that page, and I've, I've been in every one of those bars listening uh. to I mean, it just, it's really, I don't know, it's, it's something really special about it to us. 
Anthony, uh, tell me about um, the the vinyl or the CD. Where can I buy them? Is this uh, something I can get in Amazon or any specific uh, website? Absolutely, Amazon's the best place to go right now. We did uh, we did some pre-sale um, that had autographs on them. We sold out of those, but everything's out on Amazon now. You can get us on any uh, any digital platform. Yes. You But if you want physical copy, you can go on Amazon and buy it. Yeah, you know, I have it on, on streaming, you know, because I pay uh, like an Amazon uh, a subscription. I have so much here, you know, in my basement. Yeah, <laughs> I, man. I, I started to downsize and uh, streaming is the best for me because I don't have any room anymore. You can see the mess here, right? <laughs> yeah, well, man, I tell you, the music industry is, you know, just from stepping aside from the band stuff, it's just gone through such an amazing shift with technology and stuff. Yeah. We have more people in, than ever in the history of the world listening to music. And it allows us to have direct-to-fan access. So mm -hmm. we can create a, a storefront, you know, have our website, have our tour dates, our merchandise there, um, and, uh, and and interact directly with our fans and our, our friends. Man, we, we consider everybody part of our family that's helping us do this. We know that without the support of everybody out there that we couldn't do this. So we don't take it for granted that we get to spend time together and go out and do something that we love. So I, I, I guess you're, you guys are so friendly, man. Like when I met you back in the day, you know, like a couple of months ago. Yeah. Uh, in, um, and on the M3, at the M3 festival, man, you were awesome, man. Like, uh, you oh. know, you talk to everybody, you know. Uh, oh. It's so difficult to get an interview or talk to the musicians. And you guys were so cool, man, you know. So that, that I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Listen, M3 was amazing. That was a bucket list for us. We had never played it before. It's, it had been going on for 11 years. Mm -hmm. And we tried to come for the 10th anniversary. And uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> scheduling-wise and working with the promoter and stuff, we couldn't get it nailed down. And so we said, man, we definitely want to go this year. We wanted to be there this year. And, man, I had people writing me, some, some old friends of mine from our old record label, A&M, wrote me on social media and they said, hey, man, I saw Led Zeppelin open for the Who wow. at that place where we were, that amphitheater. And so I was like, man, do I need to fact check this? Should I figure out what's going on? And as I was talking to people, they said, not only that, but Janis Joplin played two nights on the stage. It's a piss and walk out on it. And, then you, and have to like, go on then you have to go on stage, and how do you feel? You're like kind of shaking. Oh, my God. <laughs> like it was so exciting. I didn't want to leave. Huge. We were so excited. It was so awesome. Oh, my God. Uh, and the crowd was super nice. Yes. Everybody we bumped into, the whole the whole experience was incredible. I mean, yeah. I, I definitely want to go back. It was fun. Yeah, but Anthony, uh, like you guys are such a solid band, you know, that you can never go wrong. So fans know that uh, everywhere you are or whatever the CD or album you deliver is going to be good, you know. And I'm not saying this because, uh, you know, I, I barely know you, right? So I saw you a couple oh. of times, but I, I've been following Torah Torah for, you know, back in when I was a kid, you know, in the early 90s, you know. And, yeah. Uh, and, uh, dude, like, it's always solid, you know, uh, good, you know, quality, what you deliver. So uh, fans know that, you know, they, 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 they perceive it. They, they receive that. And, you know, and, uh, and I'm so happy that you guys are doing all this, you know, records, uh, touring around, you know, that, that, that is so cool. And it is, know, man. Yeah, it's sorry. so exciting. And, you know, on those early records, The first record, Surprise Attack, we had uh, Joe Hardy and Paul Ebersole were the producers on it. And they were amazing, man. I mean, we were just a little freaking garage band, man, a little three-piece rock and roll outfit, man. And we went in with them, and we worked on that record for probably a year. We probably wrote 50 or 60 songs. And, man, they helped us shape an incredible product. I mean, I'm, I'm super proud of it now, that one. Cool. And then Wild America, we were even much more seasoned because... Uh, for Surprise Attack, we had never traveled. We mm -hmm. we had never toured or done anything. So when we came back to do Wild America, we were, I think, had much more confidence in our playing and our songwriting ability and all that kind of stuff. We kind of, we got some experience, man. We got some, some miles on us. So. Uh, about the songs of uh, Bastards of Beale. Yeah. Which one is your favorite one? I know it's very difficult to pick one or two, but... Uh, I, I can tell you which one is mine if you want. I can start and then yeah, go. Yeah, start or... off and then I'll tell you. <clears throat> Dude, excuse me, I'll tell you a couple months. Yeah, so mine is track number nine on Amazon. It's uh, Rose of uh, Jericho. Is uh, the right Oh, one? yeah. Oh, my God. Man, 
we were so excited about that song. Um, man, just to be totally, you know, transparent and everything, we felt like the fans helped us write this record. We just felt like all we we started off. The title was "Rock and Roll Ain't Dead Yet," and we were kind of working on it. Keith had actually driven up from Memphis. The, the whole band's based in Memphis, and I, I live up here in Nashville, but. He came up and we were playing acoustics and stuff together and we were talking about rock and roll ain't dead yet. And we started thinking about it and the characters that are in the imagery that's in the song are from experiences that we had from, from different people that we've run across through touring and stuff. Uh And uh, we ended up um, landing on that, the Rosa Jericho title just because it was, uh, it was about kind of a rebirth, you know, it was uh, like the plant that's in the desert. It, it, it kind of, uh, it kind of coils up when gotcha. it gets dry and it holds it, itself. And then when it rains, it opens back up and it blooms again. And it's kind of oh, like man. a scenario of us. We wow. kind of take a break. So, uh, but there was a lot of people that influenced that song, just little lines that would just flash in our mind of, of experiences that we had. And that, that one was really special to us. That was kind of why we wanted to kick. Uh, that was the first uh, song that we dropped off the record as a teaser. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Man, it just these floods of memories of just getting to interact, like us meeting at M3 and the things we people we met on Monster Rock, and then even because we're older, we were kind of flashing back to the, our experiences at the very beginning, all the trips that we made and the people we ran into. So I feel like that on every track on this album, especially the Sons of Zebedee, the first song that kicks it off. It the first line of the song is uh, "Let me be the first to welcome you here. Come right in and make yourself at home." It was about you're coming into our house, but this is a house that you guys built. I'm serious. And there was it was about when we get together. It's not about politics. It's not about money troubles. It's not about your health, your ailments, or what. It's about us all being in that moment together and sharing time together. Awesome. And uh, and we we kind of reflected on when we started back in Memphis. Uh, all of us, uh, two of us went to one high school and two of us went to another high school. So whenever we would play a show when we first started, we always had a built-in audience. And because those people came there and they started raising hell and stuff when we were playing, they got other people to come and start watching us and be a part of it. And so they, we really owe Memphis a debt of gratitude. All those people at the very beginning, if they wouldn't have been there, we would have never had the shot. We would have never got a record deal. They started it. But as we did that, we grew it. Everywhere we went, we made people part of our family, and we just said, "Man, when we show up, we're gonna have a great time." Awesome, man! That's the so right way to do it. That's the right way to do it, right there, man. That's one, <clears throat> and then uh, one other one that was kind of cool was, um, well, there's two other ones that kind of really stick out to me. One is the only slow song that's on there, "Lights Up the River." That was actually Track number quote. six. <laughs> it was um, it was a quote that Keith had read. Sam Phillips, the guy whose studio we were in, if y'all don't know who Sam Phillips is, he's the guy that discovered Howlin' Wolf and Elvis Presley. That was a quote from him, uh, and he talked about people that were in the rural areas, the outside of the metropolis of Memphis. Mm-hmm. They, when they're out in the country, they could look up and see the light of the city, and that was a place where they could go to make a better life for themselves. There was, you know, that was an urban setting. There was money there. They could go there and all that kind of stuff. So we couldn't believe it we were kind of writing the song and then the next thing we were standing in his studio recording the track and we were like is this wow. crazy He's like yeah. those plans lined up we're here we're in sam phillips studio he he first started in uh sun studios and then he sold that to rca when elvis hit it big and he moved down the street and he built this studio it was a it was an auto body shop and he stripped it down wow and then he, he built the studio from the ground up it's still there it's still decorated exactly like it looked like Sam Phillips was fishing to walk right. in there. It looked like 1960, you know. So you honored know, to, to record there because everybody from Bob Dylan to my fav- one of my favorites, Robert Plant, he had recorded at the studio. I mean, wow. when I was sitting there, I was just like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Wow. So that was really fun. And then another one that sticks out is The Bastards of Bill, the title track. Yes. We, we actually um, we had this... Uh, conversation about a book called bill street dynasty and it actually talked about this guy robert church okay uh, he bought bill street man after the yellow fever epidemic like in the 1800s he went in and bought it it was nothing but a dirt road and we kind of acknowledge that in the lyrics of the song but this guy robert church he was kind of he was running like uh you know uh, like uh, i guess uh 
you know, prostitution ring and he was doing gambling and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. But he built this up and he gave musicians a place to go and play their music. And it ended up turning into clubs yeah. and turning into a bunch of money. Well, he ended up, uh, this lady that ran the newspaper, as he had made a lot of wealth, he was the first black millionaire in Memphis. And as he started making money, this lady went to him and, and he actually changed his life and started helping people with wow. the money that he had earned. And it was an amazing story. So we kind of wow. started talking about the the bastards of bill title we were talking about it and we do make a lot of other references just to rock and roll in general general the all hell rock and roll you know long live yeah. bastards bill our chant but we acknowledge a lot of that that historical stuff in the song it was just really fun for us i mean bill street's where we cut our teeth man there was a little uh, uh club down there called the new daisy on bill street we played there awesome. i mean thousand times we had a ball so giants fall if you want to know about the kind of the concept we were talking about just kind of uh facing your fears man especially after um patrick had kind of gone through his health scare i mean we're all kind of thinking that kind of stuff you know um especially when something about your health pops up you know we're kind of had some crazy lifestyles you know being in bands and growing up so that kind of stuff uh always kind of gets your attention and changes your perspective but we're so excited about it. We love the song. Keith and I had a ball putting this thing together, the bridge part and all that stuff. It was, we've just had a ball. We just really enjoy being around each other and playing. You know, we still like being around each other and creating stuff, so. Got a video for this, which we shot it on Bill Street. And man, the crazy thing is we shot it in a, a venue called Handy Hall. And it's the exact same venue that we shot walking shoes in like 30 years ago. So we walked in. And it was really kind of uh, nostalgic. We went in and we were on the same exact stage where we played Walking Shoes 30 years before. Uh, we had a great guy, uh, Wahid at WA Films, shot the video with us. So we, we shot a portion of it on uh, Bill Street, and then we shot a portion of it at Sam Phillips Studio where we had recorded the record. It was awesome, man. It was so fun. and. Uh, that song, you know, brings back a lot of imagery for me, man. I pulled from a lot of experiences growing up for that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, this is plain, simple, and beautiful, man. Rock and roll. I love classic rock, man. Bad Company, Zeppelin, Cheap Trick, Aerosmith, all those people. Man, we cut our teeth on We love Zeppelin. Um, and then as we moved into the 80s, you know, Keith, our guitar player, was a big Randy Rhodes fan. He loved Randy Rhodes. They liked uh, Iron Maiden. But we loved all the, the classic rock. We loved that, man. We still, that music still stands up to us, man. So we got a lot of tour dates coming up. We're... We're adding, uh, we're adding shows as we go along through the year. We're going to have a great 2020. We're, we're setting that up. Uh, coming up right away, we're going to be up in uh, Maine and Massachusetts. We're going up to the New England Rock Fest. We can't wait to go do that. Uh, we're going to be in Massachusetts. Then we head out. I think we're going out to Salt Lake City and Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, I know we got some Texas dates coming. Uh, there's some stuff in Florida that we're looking at. So we're going to be moving around. Uh, but we're so excited. We want to invite everybody out, man. Please come see us. Say hello to us, man. We love seeing y'all and talking and, and just getting some hang time with you. So y'all come out. Also, you can find us online, toratoramusic.com. You can find us on Spotify, any yes. of your digital platforms. So please go and listen, stream it. Uh, the videos on YouTube, Son yes. of Prodigal Son. Go yes. find that, share it. So Yeah, we're we going to watch it now. We, I, when we finish the the interview, I'm gonna put that, like a minute or two of that. That that, that I love that song also. But awesome. uh, tell me if I if you wanna buy um if you wanna buy tickets, can I go or, or see the the tour dates? You know, with more details, I can go to your website toratoramusic.com, Correct? Yes, absolutely. We're on bands bands in town. We're on our website. Go to our social media. You can mm -hmm. go Tora Tora Band on Facebook, and all of our stuff's listed on there. And we love hearing from you. You guys send us messages. We're, we're on there. It's us, the guys. We're responding, talking to you. So we'd love yeah. to hear from you. Anthony, thank you so, so much for this interview. It was awesome to talking to you. And, uh, Man, to and let's do it again. We'll yeah. do some more tour dates, and I'll, I'll okay. get back on the phone with you. I'd and to... you have to promise me that more records are coming, you know, on the road, and a more tour, and uh, I'm going to be there with you guys every moment.
man thank you so much the record's coming we're gonna do a new, a new one for frontiers we know it's coming up so oh cool cool i'm i'm, I'm looking forward to 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 get that record when you awesome man. awesome man thank you so much for your time i thank really you, appreciate man. it man anthony cordell from tora tora yeah, yeah man <laughs> thank you <laughs> Hey, this is Anthony Cordo with Chora Chora, and you're watching Max One on One. Man, it's been a while. You guys ready to do this? Hey, man, what's up? Let's do it.